Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this practical overview of the Prototype ML platform and beginner slash intermediate guided tutorial implementation of ResNet, a famous convolutional neural network backbone. We encourage you to open the project and explore the Prototype ML platform for yourself during the course of this video. And now we'll show you how to use the Prototype ML platform. We'll go over the model designer interface, how to add third party components or libraries from the component repository, and how to create blocks and mutators and accompanying concepts such as ports and parameters. So let's get started. The interface is split up into three main sections. On the left hand side, you is where you'll navigate your components, add new components such as blocks, mutators, or add third party components or libraries from the package repository. You'll also be able to search your components very easily and download your code at the end of your project. The middle column is where you'll edit your blocks and mutators, while the right hand side is where you're going to edit various properties. So let's start by adding the PyTorch library as a project dependency. This gives us access to all of PyTorch's layers and functions. Click Add, click Add Package Dependency, go ahead and click on PyTorch, and click Use to add it to your project. Now within the Packages directory, you'll see that we now have PyTorch as an option. And within PyTorch, you'll find all of PyTorch functionality. Now let's create our first neural network. Let's start by creating a block, the visual equivalent of a PyTorch neural network module class. Click Add, click Block, Give the block a name, let's call it test block, and click OK. We can open the block simply by clicking on it. Welcome to the block editor, where you can visually design your neural network. The main section shows a visual graph of your neural network design, to which you can drag and drop neural network layers from the left sidebar to add them to the graph and connect them into arbitrarily complex architectures. The properties bar on the right-hand side shows various block settings and configurations, such as ports and parameters. We'll get more into depth with these later. The first thing to notice about the block editor is that every block consists of an input node and an output node. These represent the input to and the output from the PyTorch neural network module. Every node within the block represents its inputs and outputs via ports, visually indicated by the round circles found at the top and bottom of nodes. Let's go ahead and build a basic convolutional neural network. First, let's find the 2D convolution layer inside the PyTorch library. We can add this layer to our block by simply dragging and dropping this layer from the component sidebar into our block. While we're at it, let's add a max pool and a relu. Let's use the search functionality. Max pool 2D and relu. Excellent. Now we have all the components necessary to build our basic convolutional neural network. So how do we connect these components together? By clicking and dragging from any port to another port, we can create a link connecting the output and the input between the two nodes as shown. Let's connect the rest of our components. Links also allow us to visually represent more complicated interaction between nodes, such as skip connections, simply and easily. Let's add a skip connection between the input and the output. By clicking on the input port where the two links meet, we can choose how we want the two outputs to be combined and in what order. So now you've learned how to add components to your blocks and link them together in powerful ways, completely visually. Let's get back to basics. You can go ahead and click the format graph on the right hand side to very nicely visually format your graph. So now that we have the components of our neural network linked together, you might be wondering how you can edit the parameters such as the kernel size or stride of the convolution. By clicking on any node, the properties bar will switch to show that component's properties and parameters, which you can easily edit. The instance name represents the variable name of the layer. The repeats field allows you to quickly repeat the block a variable number of times, assuming the input and output shapes are compatible. The apply activation field provides you with quick access to common activation functions. Below, you will find all the various parameters you can edit for this specific component. Prototype ML supports complex parameter creation and passing, which we'll get back to later. To return to the block properties, click anywhere else on the graph. As previously noted, ports represent the inputs and outputs of a component. By default, components contain one input port and one output port. If, say, we wanted to pass two inputs to a component, we could add an additional port. You'll now notice that the input node on the graph now reflects the newly added input. While ports represent the tensor data going in and out of components, the prototype ML parameter system allows for properties to be passed between components as well. Let's say the stride of the convolution should be configurable, rather than hard-coded. Let's add a parameter for stride. You can see our newly created parameter. Now let's change the convolution to use the passed-in stride parameter rather than the hard-coded default. 
When editing a component parameter, you'll notice if there are any other parameters on the block that we can pass down to this component. Let's go ahead and delete the one and put in stride instead. The convolution, stride, will now be set to the pass stride defined by the block. So now we've added our components, defined how they connect, and even added some extra parameters and ports. We can see the code produced by this block at any time by clicking the toggle code view button on the right-hand side of the editor. As you can see, by traversing the block component graph, Prototype UML is able to generate clean, complete, and functional code automatically. Now let's dive a little deeper into the system. Blocks allow us to visually define neural networks, and either blocks or mutators can be added to a block from the component sidebar. Mutators are the second primary component of the Prototype ML platform, and allow us to encapsulate specific pieces of functionality so that they can be modularly used within the block editor while giving us complete control over functionality. Let's go ahead and have a look at the Convolution 2D mutator. The mutator editor consists of several distinct code editors, each with a specific purpose, while the property sidebar displays a view similar to that of the block with ports and parameters. Through the use of magic variables displayed in curly braces, such as highlighted, Prototype ML allows you to code complex functionality that can be reused throughout the platform. As you can see, the convolutional layer usage is separated into several components. First, the torch library itself is imported within imports. Then, the convolution is initialized in the init code block with the instance variable and params variable. When used, the instance variable will be replaced with the name of the instance as defined, and the param variable will be replaced with a formatted parameter string. Third, in the forward section, the output port variable is set to the output of the layer's forward call, which receives the input port as a parameter, and is then executed. While more convoluted than the blocks to explain, these magic variables provide users with a powerful API for integrating their components with the Prototype ML platform, and are easy to use. While not necessary for a beginner, familiarity with mutator design can be beneficial. Finally, ports and parameters can be defined just as they are with blocks. So now hopefully you're a little more familiar with the Prototype ML interface, how to create blocks, how to add components to blocks, how to connect components together within blocks, how to add ports and parameters, and how to view the code when you're done creating a project. Now we're going to switch gears, and I will guide you through the creation of a specific neural network type, in this case, a ResNet block. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, the ResNet block, or as the paper was titled, Deep Residual Learning for Image Recognition, was written by a team at Microsoft and has acquired over 62,000 citations, and is perhaps one of the most famous of what we call the backbone convolutional neural networks. As we all know, neural networks are universal function approximators and their accuracy increases with the number of layers within the network, thus deep learning. However, it's not quite that simple. Because of problems with vanishing gradients and cursive dimensionality, deep networks are unable to learn simple functions like an identity function, or a function that returns its input, if the network possesses too many layers. This is the challenge that ResNet, and specifically its residual block and skip connections, attempts to solve. In the following depiction of the residual block, you can see that in addition to the input being passed through the various convolutional layers, there's also a skip connection that directly adds the inputs to the outputs of the next block, thus preserving their gradients in the process and preventing the issue of vanishing gradients, where many gradients less than one are multiplied to produce an ever-shrinking gradient as you go deeper and deeper throughout the network, thus reducing the network's capability to learn. So ResNet very effectively solves this issue. Furthermore, it is thought that convolutional neural networks learn simple representations such as lines and angles in earlier layers and more complex objects and shapes deeper down in the network. Through the use of skip connections, deeper layers are also able to learn directly from those earlier ones, further increasing accuracy. So instead of just talking about ResNet, today we're actually going to build ResNet. Specifically, we will be building the ResNet 18 and ResNet 34 architectures. Before we get started, let's review the architecture. The ResNet architecture processes images through an initial set of convolutions before reaching its main feature, four ResNet layers at different spatial resolutions that employ residual blocks with skip connections between them and are repeated a variable number of times depending on the specific architecture type. Because of the changes in spatial resolution, between ResNet layers, we employ a one-by-one -one filter convolution to downsample the skip connections between layers. So let's get started. You're highly encouraged to open the provided project and follow along. We've built most of the blocks in advance, which we'll briefly review, and then we hope you'll join us in constructing the residual block and try out the prototype ML platform for yourself. Here's the ResNet architecture. A convolution, batch norm, ReLU, and max pool, followed by the four ResNet layers, each of which is an instance of the ResNet layer block, which we'll get to in a moment, and then an average pool, a flattened, and finally a fully connected. The size of these four layers, that is, how many times they're repeated, is defined by the parameters which we have defined, layer 1, layer 2, layer 3, and layer 4 size. And finally, the number of classes is the output of the fully connected. Any parameters can be viewed by simply hovering over one of the components or by clicking on them to view more information. So now let's open up the ResNet layer and have a look inside. The basic block here is the residual block that we will be implementing in a moment. What you're looking at is a single basic block that will downsample its input 
followed by a configurable number of basic blocks at that downsampled resolution as configured by the resident architecture type. You'll notice that we've used this repeat functionality on the second block to automatically repeat the block the number of times provided by the blocks parameter. We can in fact see this in the code itself. Finally, we define a variable called downsample that instantiates our one by one downsample convolution and passes it to the basic block. This brings us to the main event. Let's now build the basic block. Double click it to open. All right. You can see that we've already done some of the work for you in terms of defining the parameters that this block needs to receive. Now all you need to do is put in all the components in order to produce the residual block. Remember this diagram? It's time to start building exactly this. First, let's put in the various components that we need. We'll go over here, conv 2D, we're gonna need one of those. We're also gonna need a batch norm. Batch norm 2D, perfect. Okay, uh, and then we're gonna need a ReLU. Grab one of these, put that in there. Excellent, the next thing we're gonna need is another conv. So actually, we're gonna wait on this just for a moment. Now let's start connecting these. Uh, so the input goes to the conf2d, the conf2d goes to the batch norm, batch norm goes to the relu, and let's give these uh, friendly names, shall we? So conf1, we'll call it, call this one batch norm1, and relu, sure, relu1. Okay, the second thing we'll need is yet another convolution, except in this time, instead of dragging it from the side, let's use the duplicate instance functionality. So if you click on the mutator and you go to the right hand side property bar, you can click duplicate instance. That will put in an exact duplicate and it will even name it nicely. So there's conv2. Okay. And then we're gonna need one more batch norm. So let's duplicate that, create batch norm two and connect that up. And then this, we're gonna need one more relu. And duplicate and excellent. Okay. Connect the relu to here, this to the output. And now, as you can see, we have the first half of what we need to build. Let's go back and build the skip connection. Now, remember how I mentioned that the basic block sometimes needs to, needs to do downsampling from the input to the ReLU? Let's go back and we've created for you a little downsample mutator that will do exactly that. So let's go in, add the downsample, get all nice and pretty. Now the input is gonna to go to the downsample and then the downsample is gonna to go to the ReLU. Now, looking again at this diagram, you'll notice that when the skip connection meets the ReLU, it wants to be added. Let's go back and you can just click on the port here and go to concatenate and change it to add. That will now add those two outputs together before it goes into the ReLU. Finally, now that we have all the components set up, we need to go and fill in some parameters. So first let's go to the conv1. We're going to set in channels to in planes. We're going to set out channels to planes. Kernel size to three, padding to one, and bias to false. On to the next. Batch norms number of features should be set to planes to match the output of the convolution. Next, let's change ReLU to work in place. Set that to true. Now onto the second conv. Since we don't want to change the resolution here, let's set in channels to planes, out channels to planes, kernel size of three, padding of one, and bias to false. You'll notice here that all the default options are present for every single layer in the PyTorch library, so you don't actually need to go and look at documentation pretty much ever, which can be a major advantage. Let's set the second batch norm to planes, and we're going to reconfigure relu to in place equals true. All right. Now let's go to this downsample element, and we're going to want to set in planes, in planes, planes to planes, stride to stride, and downsample. We want to change instead of true or false or any of the others, we want to change to the downsample parameter as defined by this block right here. All right, and there you have it, the complete basic block. Now let's go ahead and click Format Graph. That'll just sort of organize it nicely for us. And there we go. That's the entire basic block. We can now go look at the code. And now with the basic block completed and the rest of the architecture finished, you can now test this thing out. So first of all, let's have a look at the Resident 18 block. The Resident 18 blocks, you'll see, just essentially employs the Resident 18. And if you go ahead and click on here, you'll notice that we've set all the sizes for the different layers to the necessary number of times to produce the Resident 18 architecture. 
By comparison, if we look at ResNet 34 and go ahead and hover, you'll see that this is a different configuration and produces a deeper network, or ResNet 34. Assuming you have followed along with this tutorial, I encourage you now to go over here, go ahead and download your code, open it up, unzip it, and run the test.py. This should download the pre-trained weights from the TorchVision library, and it should run your newly created model. This completes our tutorial for the ResNet architecture. Hopefully you now have a familiarity with the prototype ML interface and functionality, and we encourage you to read our documentation and check out our other videos on the advanced functionality we haven't covered in this video. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Thanks for joining us today.